Emily Grebel is Associate Professor of History at the City College of New York, um, and she's a scholar of modern Eastern Europe and the Balkans. She got her PhD from Stanford University in 2007. She has already established herself as an important voice on um, the, the sorts of questions that she's going to talk about today, um, uh, among other things, the question of Islam in Europe. Um, and social transformations, the intersection between European Muslims and social transformations of the 20th century, um, the, the first half of the 20th century, um, issues and events like the, the aftermath of the Ottoman Empire and two world wars um, in Europe and in the Balkans in particular. Her first book was called Sa Sarajevo, 1941 to 45, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Hitler's Europe. It thought about the nature of multiculturalism and the ways that a multicultural community responds to crises of occupation, civil war, and genocide. This was published in 2011 by Con Cornell University Press. Um, it was recognized in a really lovely and a glowing review in, uh, in the London Review of Books as a real game changer in thinking about those warriors um, in Sarajevo and um, the events leading up to the war. Her current book project is called Muslims on the Edge of Europe, the Making of a European Islam in the, in the Balkans. Um, and it thinks about Muslim life, politics, law, and culture in post-Ottoman um, in the post-Ottoman Balkans. Um, Emily is interested in Muslim life, politics, law, and culture in the post-Ottoman uh, uh, world. She's in this book exploring the relationship between faith and citizenship, um, integration of Sharia law and Sharia courts into European liberal state structures, and the meaning of the Muslim world for Muslims living in post-Ottoman Europe, which makes her just a wonderful speaker to introduce this series of talks for us. Um, the title of her talk today is Experiments in Legal Pluralism, uh, Sharia Law as Minority Right in Interwar Yugoslavia. Please join me in welcoming Emily Grebel. Thank you so much, Carla, and thank you all for, for coming and uh, being here today. <coughs> so in September of 1945, Ilyaza, a Muslim man, petitioned the socialist courts of the city of Novi Pazar to reject his wife's request for a divorce. She claimed that he did not provide her with adequate shoes or clothes, which she argued was justification under Sharia law to divorce him. He countered that he had worked for the Yugoslav Communist Army for four months without pay, making it difficult to provide for her, but he promised that going forward, he would live according to, quote, our Sharia laws, end quote. Such inconsistencies, a communist partisan fighter promising to follow Yugoslavia's state Sharia laws were not uncommon in early socialist Yugoslavia. We can assume, however, that Ilyaza's wife, Juzida, did not like this verdict because a few months later the couple were back in court. In order to prove once and for all that he could not provide her with shelter, which Sharia law stipulated was grounds for divorce, she burned down his house. This court case is one of many divorces among Muslims that I came across in the archives of Novi Pazar in the socialist district courts. These cases all bear the imprints of a markedly different set of pr social presumptions and legal expectations than their Christian counterparts. Many mention polygamous marriage and forced marriages as young teens. All of them in some way reference Sharia, the only legal framework through which Muslims in Yugoslavia framed their private lives and their communities. So I open with this anecdote because I think it helps us understand some of the bigger questions at stake in uh, the transformation of post-Ottoman Europe. <coughs> Historians often talk about legacy of empire in the 20th centuries, and in studies of Southeastern Europe, Islam itself is often conceptualized as a legacy of the Ottoman period. But how did imperial social norms, laws, and institutions leave their mark on the liberal and authoritarian European states to follow? What did it mean for Balkan Muslims to transform from Ottoman subjects to European citizens? <coughs> now, when we think about Ottomanism and the end of Ottomanism in Southeastern Europe, the first narratives to come to mind are often ethnic cleansing, expulsion, guerrilla conflict, especially for those of you who are familiar with the Balkan Wars or with the forced population transfers that between Greece and Turkey in 1923. But there's another story of post-Ottoman Europe, and this is one of negotiation, 
compromise and coercion. In this other story, Muslim leaders tested the boundaries and possibilities of the modern state and actively shaped what it would mean to be a Muslim minority in a European state. Now, my book project tries to integrate these two separate stories and challenge and probe the way that we think about the post-Ottoman Europe, uh, the post-Ottoman era in Europe. Now, I always think it's important for historians to talk about their research project or their research process at the beginning. And so, just to give you a little bit of background on how I sort of approach my work. <coughs> when studying minority communities in Europe, historians tend to favor the nation-state model. For example, they look at Italians or Albanians in Yugoslavia, they look at Jews in Austria, they look at Germans in Czechoslovakia, and so on. This approach is partly defined by our linguistic and archival practicalities, and also partly by the way we've been trained to think about communities as belonging to individual states. Although my story focuses on the territories that become Yugoslavia, which is my own linguistic comfort zone, <laughs> I approach my research from the community level first. And the reason for this is simple. Post-Ottoman Europe was in perpetual transformation from 1978 to the 1940s. Here's a series of maps that just give you a sense of how the region is sort of changing over time. So <coughs> at no point from 1878 to the late 1940s did Muslims presume that state lines were permanent. Muslims in Monastir, a city in Macedonia, petitioned the British to become British citizens on the eve of World War I, thinking that there's no way that any of these Balkan nation states were actually going to work out best to become part of the British Empire. Fast forward to 1943, Muslims in Sarajevo are petitioning Nazis to become a Nazi protectorate, thinking there's no way these independent state of Croatia is going to work out. We need an international protector. And Muslims in northeastern Bosnia harbored illusions through 1947 that Turkey was going to liberate them from the communists. So I wanted to understand how Muslims themselves engaged with the end of Ottomanism on their own terms. To do so, I knew I needed to scour local records, court records, madrasas, mufti reports, records from the vahfs, which are the charitable endowments uh, established under Islam. So this research project involved dragging two small kids and a dog <laughs> to various corners of the Balkans. And I love that the fact that the dog and my two-year-old both have similar expressions on their faces <laughs> in these pictures of what are we doing here. The left is in northeastern Bosnia and the right is in the Sanjak uh, outside of Sienica, a small town in southern Serbia. So there are perks to this process as well, which is that I am often the only historian to go to these places. So this is my desk in one archive. And you'll note the fresh cherries, the coffee, the orange juice. There's a real uh, culture of hospitality surrounding foreign researchers. <coughs> so I then examined the state records from ministries that dealt with Islam in places like the Kingdom of Serbia, Austria, Hungary, interwar Yugoslavia, and the independence state of Croatia, trying to situate the local stories of Muslims I had in these broader national narratives. British and French consular reports helped me draw comparisons with parts of the Balkans that were contested by Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, and also to understand the international dynamic of what's happening in this region, like why large numbers of Muslims were petitioning to return to Yugoslavia in the 1920s. <coughs> Piecing together these diverse narratives, my work seeks to explore how Southeastern Europe became an innovative laboratory for Muslim minorities and European governments to think about big questions like minority rights, citizenship, and the nature or boundaries of a secular state. So today, I am talking about one very narrow part of that, the development of legal pluralism in interwar Yugoslavia. <coughs> In a stunning victory for conservative Muslims, in 1921, Yugoslavia's constitution enshrined a Sharia judiciary in a simple clause that read, quote, family and inheritance cases involving Muslims will be adjudicated by the state's Sharia courts, end quote. From 1921 until 1946, Muslims in Yugoslav lands had the right 
and the obligation to conduct all family matters as well as any legal dispute over property or any legal dispute involving the vach, the endow religious endowments, through a shudia, sharia judiciary, which adjudicated according to Islamic law. Contrary to religious practices in most liberal democracies, where individuals can choose to participate in a religious legal system, Muslims had no choice in this matter. There was no opt-out clause, not for Muslims who had previously lived or married in areas that followed civil law. And even more surprising, the government expected non-Muslims to abide by Sharia in certain legal issues, such as divorces where one party was Muslim or in a property dispute involving Muslim lands. The legal pluralist, the pluralist legal system raised practical and philosophical problems for the emerging Yugoslav state, and it also tested the limits of minority rights and protections. On the one hand, the persistence of a Sharia judiciary fundamentally defied modern understandings of concepts like citizenship, emancipation, and legal equality, through which individuals become detached from their religious laws and structures and instead become part of a community of secular citizens. On the other hand, Muslim minorities overwhelmingly believed that legal segregation was the only way to be treated equally as a minority in Europe. So in my time today, I'd like to briefly discuss why the Yugoslav government agreed to this, why Muslims pushed for the enshrinement of a Sharia judiciary in the Constitution, and then some of the problems that occurred as a result in the interwar Yugoslav state. <coughs> so to begin with the state, why would a new government coming out of the Great War and the Wilsonian principles of self-determination agree to enshrine Sharia in its constitution? <coughs> and I suggest it was a combination of three reasons. One, international pressures to protect minorities. Two, pragmatic state building. And three, a tool of nation building. <coughs> So when Yugoslavia joined the international system of states in 1919, it signed the Paris Peace Treaties, which included minority protection clauses. The great powers recognized that redrawing imperial borders after the war had the makings of an international humanitarian crisis, and they hoped that requiring new states to sign these clauses would help to prevent some degree of mass violence and expulsion of minority populations. Signing the clauses was the price of diplomatic recognition, and Yugoslav authori authorities, unlike Poles, for example, did not seem to hesitate in agreeing. The treaty guaranteed minority communities the right to speak their national language, practice their faiths, and run their own schools and societies. Now, minority communities could technically appeal to the League of Nations if they felt these rights had been violated, but there were very few systems in place that actually made this viable. <coughs> In accordance with their own understanding of what this meant, the new Yugoslav government opened its existing Sharia courts for business, kept imams and muftis in their posts, and left madrasas and maktabs, which are Islamic religious elementary schools, in the hands of local teachers. While there was much violence in this post-war period, which I'm going to explain in more detail in a moment, such policies are still quite remarkable because many of these imams, muftis, and teachers had spent the preceding decade fighting the authorities who now employed them. So while courting goodwill with the international community was important, <coughs> the new Yugoslav government also had very pragmatic reasons for doing this. They faced a bureaucratic nightmare <laughs> of reconciling diverse legal, political, economic, and social institutions. This was a country that was bringing together lands from the Habsburg Empire, both the Austrian and Hungarian sections, the former Ottoman Empire, the Kingdom of, Hung uh, of Montenegro, and the Kingdom of Serbia. Resolving commercial and criminal matters took priority, and so the state largely deferred to local and regional socio-religious and social-legal <coughs> precedents. The continuity of Sharia fit nicely with this transitional model. The challenge, of course, was that a transitional system quickly becomes a default norm if it's not changed. Which brings us to the third reason why Yugoslav leaders enshrined Sharia. They realized that the Sharia judiciary could be a tool, a powerful tool, in the modernization and assimilation of Muslims. The Sharia judiciary was never relegated to a separate religious sphere. 
Muslim judges were state bureaucrats. They were subject to government pay scales, pension, vacation, and death benefits. At one point, there was even a special clause and fund put aside so that they could go on the Hajj. The government not only decided how to staff courts, it also determined how judges would be trained, and it opened schools with the explicit purpose of training Sharia court judges in Yugoslavia. <coughs> By the early 1930s, the government had opened a faculty of Sharia law at the University of Belgrade and a smaller program in Sharia family law at the University of Zagreb, both of which sought to siphon off students bound for schools in Cairo, Istanbul, or Algiers, and instead train them to think like Yugoslav Muslims. <coughs> so that's the state. <coughs> Why did Muslims push for this constitutional clause? <coughs> In 1918, Muslim leaders around Yugoslavia surveyed the scene and were deeply concerned about what life was going to look like for them. This is actually a map from 1991, but it's the best I can find that tries to look at religious breakdowns of communities. And unfortunately, Macedonia has changed dramatically, um, but I've highlighted here some of the towns I'm going to be talking about, um, just so you can see where they are. And the green parts, as well as the orange in Macedonia, represent areas with significant Muslim populations at this time. So <coughs> the region in 1918, this entire region had just spent about a decade in the throes of war, divisive conflict, uprising, occupation. An exodus of elite and educated Muslims had occurred everywhere, fueling fears of the eradication of Muslim life, that's a quote, and the loss of homeland. Such fears became compounded by the blurry lines of peace in 1918. Liberation and South Slavic independence, Yugoslav independence, meant something very different to the hundreds of thousands of Ottoman, Habsburg, and guerrilla soldiers who had just spent a decade fighting the Serb and Montenegrin armies than it did to those who were liberating these new territories and forging a state. <coughs> the trauma of this transitional occupation period combined with post-war retribution policies, and this gave many Muslims the feeling that a hierarchy of citizenship was fo forming and they were on the bottom. Arriving soldiers pillaged villages, burned estates, and canned Muslim bureaucrats from jobs in schools, uh, government, and even railroads. Troop levels in Macedonia and Kosovo, the southern territories, <coughs> raised from around 2,000 in 1918, at the end of the war, to 20,000 in 1920. This is hardly a signifier of peaceful unification. Muslims from Bielopolje, a Muslim-majority town in Montenegro, complained that from the liberation in late 1918 until September 1919, Christian officials had thrown out their votes, indiscriminately taken their property, and vengefully targeted Muslim civilians. In appeal to the central government in Belgrade, they called life for Muslims unbearable and asked, quote, will the government ensure that Muslims have the rights that were given to them by the laws of this country, end quote. Similarly, in 1920, a prominent mufti in Bosnia circulated a petition to the government on behalf of Muslims in which he argued that Serb politicians wanted to, quote, turn Muslims into second or probably third class citizens, quote and that local authorities treated any discussion of discrimination as treason. He's not entirely wrong here. <coughs> local authorities wielded significant power, openly ignoring warnings from the central government in Belgrade to treat Muslims better. When the Ministry of the Interior reprimanded an official in Orhid, Macedonia, for failing to protect local Muslims from attacks, the official responded that the ministry did not know, quote, how it is to deal with Muslims in this region, quote. An official in Sienica, Serbia, similarly defended himself by arguing that Muslims, quote, did not feel Serbian and could not be trusted, quote. Furthermore, he argued it wasn't true to suggest that authorities didn't treat Muslims equally. In fact, he claimed Muslims were so free in the new state that they openly and frequently complained about it. Quote, everything bothers them in this new country of ours since they do not feel Serbian and nor will they feel that way for a long time, quote. This Retort spoke to a fundamental challenge of post-war 
reconciliation across war-torn Europe, not just with Muslims in Yugoslavia, but everywhere? How do you integrate a Muslim, or uh, sorry, a minority community that has no interest in living in your state, but who does not want to leave their home? As a group, Muslims did not fit easily into this box of minorities entitled to protections by the minority protection clauses. They spoke many different languages and practiced different customs and laws. Some identified as Albanian or Turkish, which meant that they could petition for rights on national or linguistic terms, but the majority spoke some form of a South Slavic dialect and were considered, at least by the national ideologies, to be members of the Yugoslav nation, not a minority. As the Norte took sh shape, Muslim leaders recognized the ambiguity in their position and demanded that the government, quote, protect us like a minority. In 1920, a group in Novi Pazar passed a resolution that called for the protection of Islamic law in order to guarantee Muslims, quote, political freedom in a climate where they are seen as uninformed, fanaticized masses, quote. This belief that political equality in a European democracy was contingent upon the preservation of Sharia became so pervasive that the first Muslim political organization to form in the southern territories called itself the Islamic Association for Preserving Law. And interestingly, an Ottomanist colleague pointed out to me that the word that they used here, the Ottoman Turkish word for law, hukuk, is also the Arabic plural for rights. And the term is frequently translated by scholars as the protection of rights, which I think evolved actually out of the emerging discourse on European minority rights. So by 1921, three years into this new state, Muslim politicians believed that the constitutional protection of Sharia was the only way that the Yugoslav government could demonstrate its long-term commitment to its citizens, and they made their support of the new state contingent upon it. Certainly, not all Muslims wanted a separate Sharia judiciary. There were groups of progressive Muslims that argued that Muslims were a part of the Yugoslav nation, not a national minority, and that they should fight against legal separateness. Muslims, a political poster warned in 1920, it is a lie and the meanest deception if anyone tells you that we cannot be protected in this state as any other citizen. We do not need external help. Our rights are guaranteed by the state's laws. Quote. A Muslim socialist went so far as to call the deal a medieval currency for buying Muslim votes for the Constitution. But the vast majority of Muslim community leaders pushed for the enshrinement of Sharia and they won. And I use the term community leaders here deliberately because, as we'll see, the Muslims who supported our Sharia judiciary represented a range of political, religious, and legal positions, all with very different ideas of what this was going to look like. So here we are in 1921. Sharia is enshrined in the Yugoslav constitution. What next? What would this legal system look like? What kinds of problems would it have? Well, the first major problem was that there was actually no Sharia judiciary to speak of. In parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Austro-Hungarians had developed a comprehensive system of Sharia courts with centralized schools that train Sharia judges. And we have in the audience here one of a scholar who wrote the foremost book that talks about how these institutions formed in the Habsburg period, uh, Robert Donia. This would become something of an institutional model that the state sought to create with various degrees of success in other areas. But in other parts of the country, and here you can kind of see down, particularly in Montenegro and southern Serbia and Kosovo and, and Macedonia, the system was decentralized. Judges largely adjudicated according to their own interpretations of Sharia and their own local practices. Muftis, who were the highest legal experts in the land, had assumed various political and economic roles in the preceding decades as the Ottoman Empire had retracted and through all of the different wars. And many of them had no interest in having their positions challenged by a centralized Sharia system or a new bureaucracy of courts. In these southern territories, the madrasas continued to operate exclusively in Ottoman, Turkish, and Arabic, barely touching secular subjects. A report from the Yugoslav Ministry of Religion noted in 1923 that of the 50 muftis and 600 imams working in the territories of southern Serbia, which for them include Kosovo and Macedonia, not one knew Serb or Croatian, 
and everyone asked has expressed hostility toward the state. In addition to the absence of central institutions, Muslims in Yugoslavia also had deeply conflicting interpretations of Sharia. In Prizren, a city in Kosovo, Dervish brotherhoods practiced Sufi mysticism and often used alcohol in their services. In Tuzla, Bosnia, conservative Sunni Muslims viewed this as a grave violation of Sharia. It's a picture from Zagreb. In Zagreb, Croatia, Muslim women wore high heels and makeup, even to their marriage ceremonies in the local Sharia courts and to religious schools. Very different in Novi Pazar, where it would be three decades before an inkling of debate would emerge over the possibility of Muslim women wearing anything other than a fereja, which was a black and white gown worn with a headscarf and a dark veil covering their face. Four distinct interpretations of Islamic inheritance law existed in the state, which complicated questions of agrarian reform and property law. Marital policies, meanwhile, varied regionally. Some places followed traditional customs, like a town of Kichevo, Macedonia, where the local mufti explicitly forbade, quote, marriages of siblings by milk, quote, which are people who had been breastfed by the same woman but were not biologically related. Polygamy was a central feature of family life in many parts of Sanjak and Macedonia. And Sanjak is the territory between Serbia and Montenegro. <coughs> um, while in Bosnia-Herzegovina, groups of Muslim reformists, which was a religious movement and philosophy, not a secular one, uh, encouraged Sharia judges to ignore the legality of polygamy, which they found, quote, uncomfortable <laughs> to deal with, and they also rebuked policies like the marriage of minors and the cancellation of marriage, which was the where a husband could abruptly uh, end a marriage on the spot through proclamation, declaring these as acts that violated, quote, modern understandings of morality. So the Belgrade government recognized that if it was actually going to use the Sharia judiciary as a tool for integration and cultural modernization, it needed a cohort of Muslim judges who would think like Yugoslavs and work with the government to end these practices that it deemed archaic, backwards, and not European. Now, Yugoslavia had a vision of itself in the early 1920s as a democratic, modern European state, and polygamy, child marriage, and burqas did not fit this image. So what do they do? They start by focusing on schools. State-sponsored madrasas and Sharia court schools become a major focus of government attention and financing. The Ministry of Religion established a separate, separate Muslim bureau, which became involved in everything from designing the curriculum of schools to appointing teachers and firing teachers. And many of the teachers in these schools were non-Muslim. While never outlawing practices that it found distasteful or backwards, which would have for the government been sort of too far in the direction of invading these, the autonomy of the Sharia judiciary, it nevertheless sought to regulate these practices. So it taxed polygamy in 1924, and it required health certificates for anyone performing a religious circumcision in 1925, and failing to abide by these laws could result in imprisonment. Now, Sharia judges used their positions within the court to respond to these calls for modernization while eking out the greatest possible autonomy from within the system itself. So responding to state concerns about the private nature of Muslim marriage, Sharia courts in Bosnia required registration of marriage. Have a marriage certificate, put it on file, there you go. Responding to state concerns about polygamy, the Sharia courts required proof of financial stability before taking a second wife. Judges were willing to work with the government as long as they maintained authority over religious questions. Indeed, Hafiz Abdullah Bushatlich, who served as Chief Justice at the Supreme Sharia Court, noted in a 1927 legal manual, quote, Sharia courts perform their duties independently according to Sharia law and state laws as long as the latter is not in discord with the tenets of the Islamic religion. In other words, state laws should be respected, but they remain secondary to Sharia law. <coughs> 
the religious character of the Sharia judiciary came into question in 1929 when the Yugoslav king, who had just assumed authoritarian powers, radically revised the system. He formalized a three-tier system of local appeals and supreme Sharia courts, mandated certain educational and linguistic requirements for judges, and explicitly spelled out in law, quote, Sharia court judges adjudicate on behalf of his majesty. Now, while everyone had understood that the Sharia courts were state courts, the assertion that they served the king's interest, even announcing their verdicts now on behalf and the name of the king, raised questions on the line between the civil and religious spheres. Interestingly, this 1929 law also expanded the jurisdiction of Sharia judges by giving them the authority to fine or even incarcerate guilty parties. And it also gave a nod to conservative Muslims by formally prohibiting women from serving as Sharia judges. It seems that the king recognized that this centralized court would only be useful as useful as it was powerful, and Muslim leaders needed to continue to have a stake in the system if the Sharia judiciary would be a viable tool for modernization. Many conservative judges hoped this law would lead to greater powers. Some petitioned the Supreme Sharia courts to have Muslims who violated Sharia be declared an apostate and denied an Islamic burial. But as far as I can tell, the senior judges ignored these petitions, suggesting the high court did not really want to test the extent of its authority and see if the government would actually back up this right that they had to jail guilty parties. Some Muslim leaders called on the Yugoslav government to codify Sharia procedural law within Yugoslav state law. They believed this would enable the centralization of the Muslim community and demonstrate that Islamic law was compatible with the legal system of a liberal state. But the government refused, perhaps because it hoped to eliminate the pluralist system over time, perhaps because it was not a state priority, or perhaps, like the Supreme Court judges, government authorities did not want to step over this illusory line that divided the liberal state structures from the Sharia judiciary. <coughs> the government did, however, show support for internal Muslim efforts at centralization when it served their interests. So, for example, Sunni Muslims abolished the dervish orders in Yugoslavia on the grounds that they practiced a false Islam. In their reasoning to the state, however, they underscored that many dervish brotherhoods worked in Albanian or Turkish, threatening efforts of building a Yugoslav Muslim community, which should operate in Serbo-Croatian. Mm. Furious, the dervishes from Prizren and Kosovo protested to the government in 1931, and they demanded a reversal of the decision. They argued that the majority of Muslims in Yugoslavia were not enlightened enough to understand Islamic philosophy or their work. But they wrote this letter in Ottoman Turkish, roughly 20 years after being drawn out of the map of the Ottoman Empire. And they offered the government no political incentive to listen to them. So they were ignored. And such groups increasingly became marginalized and hostile to the state, often retreating into private worlds. Another challenge posed by the system of legal pluralism, and the last sort of major challenge I'll discuss today, was confusion over legal hierarchies. For example, in an article on agrarian reform, a writer noted that because of the sanctity of Islamic inheritance law, the state inadvertently treated Muslim peasant women differently from Christian peasants, creating a hierarchy where religious law took pre precedent to state property laws. The only solution to creating equality in the realm of property, he believed, was to abolish the Sharia judiciary. Questions of women's rights and the meaning of emancipation and equality also undergirded a legal analysis in 1936, in which legal scholar Milan Bartosz argued that if Yugoslavia was going to really function like a liberal democracy, Muslims needed a choice of whether they wanted to participate in the Sharia judiciary, a choice that Muslims in French Morocco, for example, had. Within the socio-religious legal system, interfaith marriages also became a question of legal hierarchy. The Yugoslav government did not want to forbid members of the Yugoslav nation from marrying each other, even if they practiced different faiths. The ideology that undergirded Yugoslavism was that South Slavs belonged to the same nation, regardless of what religion 
they practiced. But different religious institutions practiced different laws, and there were no checks in place and no meaningful state intervention. <coughs> a Catholic priest could marry a Muslim in his church without any recourse, although technically doing so violated the state's constitution. In order to create an internal system of policing entry into the faith, in 1938, the head of the Islamic religious community, a title called the Rais Ululema, which is somewhat equivalent to a grand mufti or a chief mufti, unilaterally banned mixed marriages in Yugoslavia. Now this ban was surprising because Sharia explicitly allows Muslim men to marry non-Muslim women. Indeed, I've actually been hard-pressed to find comparable bans anywhere else in the world, and I would welcome if anyone knows of any, because this seems quite uh, unusual. But if there were no mechanisms in place to preserve the integrity of Islamic law and the sovereignty of the Sharia judiciary, Muslim re leaders realized that the government could easily erase their minority right to legal separateness. <coughs> By the late 1930s, Legal thinkers and politicians began to question if Muslims could really be equal citizens if they had separate laws that were not subject to liberal state management. Calls for the abolition of Sharia grew louder, as did government attempts to modify Islamic practice from the top down, a reversal of the earlier process that had left such modifications exclusively in the hands of the Sharia judiciary. In 1938, the Rais al-Ulima, this chief mufti, still had powers to modify Islamic law within his state, and so he did. <coughs> this story that I have introduced has tried to complicate our understanding of several larger European narratives of the 20th century. First, these lines of defining imperialism and the nation state, thinking about 1918 as a marker, were hazy at best. Modern states adapted and integrated diverse imperial structures. Post-imperialism needs to be understood as a fluid and complex period, one in which states and governments were not taken for granted by the peoples they ruled. Conceptually, Ottoman legacy needs to be parsed out in ways that take seriously these legal, economic, political, and cultural experiments that occurred throughout Southeastern Europe. <coughs> Second, Although the Sharia judiciary was instituted using the discourse of minority protections, it became a vehicle for transforming an imperial religious group into a European political minority. Historian Aaron Rodrigue, a historian of um, the Ottoman Empire and, and Balkan Sephardim, has argued that the European political concept of minority that we work with today did not conform to Ottoman understandings of identity or their legal structures. And only when they became citizens of nation states did one-time Ottoman subjects come to be conceived of as majority or minority populations. Indeed, I would argue that the irony of minority rights clauses was that while guaranteeing rights, they also forced minorities to think about themselves as members of marginalized populations that required special protections and separate legal and cultural institutions. The pressure to form a single Muslim minority in Yugoslavia was also felt deeply within the community itself. This in turn fueled internal conflicts. One of my favorite archival discoveries was a front page editorial in a Muslim newspaper in Bosnia in 1933, which attacked Muslims in the Sanjak region of Serbia and Montenegro. And I'll just go back to that the map. So. where kind of between Serbia, Montenegro, and Kosovo. So their attack was because the Sanjak Muslims refused to work with them. Let's take a look at the worst of them. This is a quote. Mulyitsa Pasic, born degenerate. In the prime of the Abdul Hamid era, which is the late 19th century Ottoman Empire, he developed into a selfish, soulless, slimy, creepy, and poisonous intriguer and troublemaker. Endlessly greedy and egotistical, but without sufficient ability and skills to obtain money and position through honest work, 
he would first strip a person to the bone and then provide for them using public resources. In order to achieve his names, aims, he needed one accomplice with authority. And here authority has the connotation of religious, legal, political authority. He found that person in Mufti Shachar Kadich. This was a major Muslim Mufti legal figure who had assumed many different powers. The Mufti was very good in filling this role. First, he attracted people into his circle. Some were enchanted by his position. Some joined because of blood relations. Some because of promises of high positions. Some with loans. Some because they were promised protection after raping poor women who had been entrusted to them. In any case, the Mufti gathered a large group of people whose task was to pile wood on the bonfire of Muslim unity. Quote, front page, editorial, major newspaper. In other words, anyone who resisted centralization, whether for political or religious reasons, risked being publicly rebuked as degenerate rapists seeking to destroy Islam and the Muslim community. Ultimately, communities of Muslim minorities in Yugoslavia divided in their response to the enshrinement of Sharia. Here we go. Sorry. One faction rejected it outright, a position they retained for the duration of the interwar period. They did not believe that Muslims needed a separate legal system, and they consistently returned to this question and said, we should all be under one law. That will be the best way to guarantee our minority rights. A second faction actively supported the Sharia judiciary and sought to centralize it according to their own understandings of Islam. Over time, however, many among this second group started to wonder if they had made a grave mistake. As the state's commitment to their legal authority grew questionable, Muslim jurists and community leaders became increasingly conservative in their interpretation and practice of Sharia, as is evinced by this outlawing of mixed marriages in 1938. By the 1940s, many Muslims who had actively participated in the Yugoslav public sphere started to join new conservative, Islamist, and revivalist movements that gradually decided the Yugoslav state had to go. And in the 1940s, they would develop connections with the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. The third set of communities, found largely in the southern regions of the state, places like Sanjak, Macedonia, Kosovo, rejected centralization of the Sharia judiciary or modifications of their practice of Islam, and instead retreated deeply into a private sphere. In many places like Novi Pazar, the town where Ilyaza and Juzida went through their messy divorce in 1945, a parallel society flourished in which Muslims participated on the margins of the liberal state. Polygamous marriages were common, muftis remained all-powerful, and women dared not engage the public sphere. Indeed, at the moment of Yugoslavia's collapse in 1941, Muslims in many parts of the state showed little sign of having spent 20 years as citizens of a liberal European nation-state. Thank you very much. <coughs> I would love to open it up to questions. Is that Excellent. your <laughs> Excellent. Okay, great. Yes. Uh, would, would you mind introducing yourself just so I know who the question comes from? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent questions. I'm sorry I didn't discuss the demographics more 
Um, so Muslims represented about 11% of the state at the 1931 census. But the census was complicated because not all Muslims identified as under sort of a Muslim rubric. And there were challenges in terms of the ways that people were considered by nation. So the majority of Muslims were identified as like Albanian or Turkish, but for people who identified as Serb or Croat, they would often get shifted into those national categories on in, in various censuses. So I think we can work with the assumption that by um, the early 1940s, roughly 11% of this population was still Muslim. There's also mass migration that happens, and those numbers are deeply conflicting over how many people leave and, and when. So um, there were certainly places where Muslims were a majority population. Um, let me go back here. So if you look at this map, the green areas uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the middle and also in Sanjak, which is in the area between Serbia and Montenegro, those are territories that were Muslim majority populations. There were also significant territories in Kosovo, which was almost entirely um, Albanian Muslim, um, and also in parts of Macedonia, which had Albanian, Turkish, and South Slavic Muslim communities. Um, many of the places where um, the system sort of self-pleased itself were Muslim majority areas. The challenges would come largely in areas that were more multicultural, because if a community is sort of living in alone, it doesn't have the same questions of other communities, you know, legal precedents fitting in. Um, so the Sharia courts, they, this was part, you know, the system as it was designed by the state was on the local, regional, and supreme court levels. Um, that did not get built in the same way everywhere. In many parts of Kosovo and Montenegro, they just continued to defer to the local court precedent, although technically they were supposed to build these new courts. And they did actually expand the Sharia courts, which is somewhat ironic that you had this democratic state building Sharia courts in places where they had never existed before because they had to have a mechanism in place in order to serve these communities now that they had required that they follow Sharia law. Non-Muslim responses. Most non-Muslims who were in these cases, involved in them, simply ignored any verdict from a Sharia court. They, you know, if the Sharia court said that the child of a divorce was going to go live with the mother, um, I'm sorry, with the father, the Muslim father, the Catholic mother would say, who are you to tell me that I'm going to send my kid to live with this guy and he's going to raise him Muslim? And she would pick the child up and move somewhere else and raise the child Catholic. And these are these debates and petitions are partly what fueled in the 1930s decision to end mixed marriages and to require that Muslims that decided to enter into one, which they could still do because there was no policing of the system, essentially were barred from being considered part of the Muslim community. So a more narrow community would allow them to sort of strengthen the legal presumptions on which on which they governed. You're welcome. I will note there's a really fascinating set of cases in 1940 where the Croatian government, which at that point had just taken over half of Yugoslavia um, in terms of uh, half of Bosnia in its governing, they tried to change imams into Catholic priests and give them the same rights. Um, they want them to be able to do marriages. They want to cut out the whole Sharia court system and instead kind of transform Islam so it would work like Catholicism. And they send a petition to every judge in the region. And it's the Catholic judges that write back with the most sort of passionate responses of, you can't do this. This is a separate religion. They don't function this way. Islam is a religion of law and they don't operate in the same presumptions is Catholicism, and we wouldn't want anyone from the state coming in and telling us how to run the Catholic Church, so get your you know, hands out of the Islamic judiciary. So that's kind of a, another way non-Muslims respond. Yeah. Yes? 
So I'll start with the second question. Um, it's often hard to find you know, women's voices in these documents. Um, about 98% of the southern Serbian area was illiterate in Serbo-Croatian uh, up through the late 1940s. And that's the sort of southern territories of Macedonia, Kosovo. And this is something that the socialist government comes in and, and tries to tackle. There is literacy <coughs> in Ottoman Turkish and in Arabic, um, but that's primarily limited to men. So one of the ways I try to get at how women were sort of managing and operating within the system is through court cases. Um, and here, you know, I, I get the sense that um, there is a deep respect for the religious legal process, and they operate comfortably within it. For example, uh, in 1919, we see a wave of requests for divorces based, uh, initiated by women based on an Ottoman family law reform. And so you have all of a sudden all of these women saying, we know what the law is and we want divorces for these reasons, not rejecting the system, but operating and figuring out how to sort of manage their, their position within it. Um, there's also a number, a lot of cases of women who are angry about sort of their status in polygamous marriages, but the cases and the testimony that give are not about sort of the institution of polygamy, but rather you know, that they were the second wife or you know, the first wife got all the cows and you know, they're stuck in this house with you know, eight children. And, you know, so it's these kinds of, of complaints. So there's really, I, I don't come across really any sources um, of women sort of fighting against the system as a whole in with from within the religious, sort of more conservative religious communities. Um, after the war, the, the socialists, the partisans, the communist partisans win, and uh, Yugoslavia becomes a socialist state. Uh, in 1946, uh, the socialist, socialist Yugoslavia abolishes Sharia law and the Sharia courts. But well into the early 1950s, local communities are still using Sharia. Even partisan, communist partisan judges are still referring to Sharia in various uh, contexts. And I, and I think that this you know, speaks to a pragmatic issue where you've had communities that have lived in a certain legal context for s generations and that trying to just tell them, okay, well now you have a totally new legal system, didn't always work. And so in, in, in certain moments, the socialist judges actually try to use Sharia to convince people that you know, they have more rights. You know, for example, you, know, you have the right to divorce your alcoholic spouse who's not taking care of you. And so that's uh, grounded in the socialist presumption that a woman can initiate divorce, but they use the rhetoric of Sharia to try to help people kind of think about what their legal rights are. What we do see, I mean, the, the picture I showed you of, of Novi Pazar, let's see, uh, you know, on here in, in Sarajevo, um, you know, these are pictures from the socialist period. Um, it, it took a long time for sort of these norms and cultures to sort of change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking about the question of marriage and how do women live in the 20th century. You know, is it because they're rational? Obviously, because mm -hmm. they're rational. Or they, or do they talk to that question in Ottoman society and Arabic? And so there's a kind of like disconnect there, I'd argue. Absolutely. Yeah, they would publish a circular, usually referring to some kind of legal precedent set in Egypt or Turkey. Um, and they published it in Serbo-Croatian. And they had an, a thriving print culture. Oftentimes they would include references in Arabic within the publications, uh, but it part of sort of the bureau bureaucratization of the Sharia judiciary, especially in, in Bosnia, was this idea that this is functioning, it's compatible with 
every other system we have. And we're going to publish our laws. We're going to print them in Serbo-Croatian. We are Yugoslav Muslims. Yes, we have this other system in place. But we're going to do it in a way that you know, refers to legal precedents, to other examples, to how other countries do it, um, and really try to present a rationale, which works in places where people speak Serbo-Croatian and read it. But in territories where you know, children were not being educated in that language, you had you know, a, a different kind of dynamic or response. And in most of those other places, they just would ignore them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that he does not. Really? No, he does not make a case. It's uh, that actually, I would not call that a fatwa. Um, he he does that more as sort of a sort of circular publication. Um, I would I would say that particular one is kind of he uses his role as the chief mufti to sort of announce and make a proclamation of, of what he's, you know, what's going to be policy from now on. And it comes after a series of articles he, he penned over the dangers of secularism and how mixed marriage was leading to kind of a dilution of Muslim values and threatening the integrity of the Muslim family. Yeah. Yes, Bob. Uh, absolutely. So the drive for centralization came largely from within the Serbo-Croatian speaking community, which sort of in the example for ex um, that I gave about you know, outlying the Sufi dervish orders, right? That those were many of those were thriving in Albanian parts. So you know, while framed as we're purifying the practice of Islam, there was this sense of, you know, who are these Slavic-speaking Muslims coming in and telling us how to practice Islam? So you, you definitely see a rejection of centralization um, within communities that don't agree with the central Serbo-Croatian model. But even that servo, I mean, part of what's so complicated here is the diversity within <laughs> Muslim communities. Because even within that servo Croatian speaking community, you had radically opposed factions like the two I was describing in the quote at the end, which are both servo Croatian speaking Muslims, but have fundamentally different ideas of how the Islam, Islam should function in the state and the relationship. And a real irony in this process is that at certain moments, conservative Muslims, are actually much closer to the state because they they align with the state against the Yugoslav Muslim organization and it's which has sort of which is a major political party in the interwar and has kind of a Muslim reformist angle which is drawing from Egypt and the sort of international reform movement of, of Islam so you have these sort of internal <laughs> divisions that then play out in different ways, and they're both trying to negotiate with the state for the best deal. Um, and so certain kind of muftis, people often will see, oh, well, look, this mufti is working for Belgrade. He must be secular and pro-Serb. But in fact, oftentimes, those muftis were significantly more conservative than their, their counterparts who were working against the Belgrade government. And it was an internal conflict that was driving that alliance and not kind of a relationship to the state. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So the League of Nations, no. I have not found any other than sort of being used early on to set the framework of discussion. Uh, I have not come across the League of Nations ever sort of intervening on the ground. There were reports that were constantly sent to sort of demonstrate how Yugoslavia was actively protecting its minorities. Um, but I haven't found any evidence of you know, the League sending people to kind of investigate, um, which happens actually after the war. You have certain sort of UN commissions from Egypt, for example, go to socialist Yugoslavia to kind of talk about are Muslims actually having freedom of religion. Um, the international sort of, kind of um, influence I is largely um, a intellectual one. Uh, a, there was, uh, in Egypt in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, a Muslim reform movement. They published wa uh, widely, and Muslims in this region, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where through the Austro-Hungarian period they had uh, expanded education opportunities, uh, they were actively reading and responding and publishing their own versions. Um, so, for example, in the 1920s, there's a lively debate over whether wearing a veil, not a headscarf, but a veil, was required by Sharia or not. And the, the Muslims who, the Muslim reformists, uh, looked at international precedent to, s to make an argument that, you know, in Egypt, in Turkey, in Afghanistan, you know, women were not required to wear the veil, and then they, they made sort of counter arguments about how, you know, those women actually knew Islam better than Mus uh, Muslim women in Yugoslavia, uh, where they were sort of required to remain in the private sphere. So there's, there's a lot of sort of international dialogue that goes on. There's also um, travel. The Balkans are quite close to the <laughs> North Africa and the broader Mediterranean, and, and people travel. They go on the Hajj, and they, they have boats that leave from Dubrovnik, and they left travelogues and diaries and reports, and they talk about these experiences. Uh, there's a great uh, Muslim intellectual from Sarajevo who, en who goes to Cairo, and he's at al Abzar, and all of a sudden, which is a major university, uh, and he, he realizes there's you know Muslims there who speak his language, and so he he recognizes that they're bringing those you know people are training abroad and coming home and sort of bringing those those lessons, and so there's this intellectual dynamic, but not so much one of intervention um, or political kind of influence. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, they absolutely use discourses of modernity. They do so primarily through the lens of education and equality. The distinction that you see with Albania is this idea that legal equality requires the right to practice one's l the laws of one's faith. And Albania removes that, uh, as does Turkey, which is, of course, the most sort of well-known example of, of a secularizing state. And so at different times in different iterations of, of my talk and my work, I always struggle with, you know, people talk about secular Yugoslavia, but really, I mean, what does secular mean when you're deferring to socio-religious law for, for communities? And, and they actually respond very harshly to those movements in Albania and Turkey. Um, there is a real sense that those are sellouts and that they have sort of abandoned the principles of Islam. Um, and after Kamal comes to power and, you know, starts to initiate his reforms, you see in a movement of really conservative Muslims who actually move back to Yugoslavia and they s develop their own madrasas based on the old Ottoman style. So you actually, what happens in Yugoslavia is you have sort of the freedom of religion encourages Muslims from other places to come and, and set up shop where they can't do that. And Albania is a really interesting and, you know, 
I was trying to condense for a, a generalist audience, but Albania is fascinating because so often we think of the Albanian-speaking Muslim population as having wanted to join Albania, but in fact many did not because they had significantly greater legal and religious rights in Yugoslavia than they would have in Albania. So they don't want to become part of Albania. They're seeing actually that as a dangerous secular trend of the, uh, you know, the uh, when Albania abolishes Sharia law, they're, they're outraged. So they're sort of stuck in this position where you know, Yugoslavia is, is actually the best <laughs> possible option right now, right? I mean, you know, they don't really have many places to go in the post-Ottoman world to, to operate somewhat independently. And it's not considered good enough, but it's still considered better than these other places. Yes. So every religious community had somewhat the ability to practice its religion, uh, which included sort of somewhat, but it was always a little bit vague, you know, how they could follow the laws of their faith. Uh, the Muslim community was the only community to receive that protection in law. Um, and it was the only community where the state took a vested interest in developing know, a separate Sharia judiciary to manage. Um, so you know, the Jewish minority, for example, was free to practice their faith and um, there was no civil marriage. So they, you know, you had to marry in some kind of religious institution. Um, but at the same token, there was no sort of state intervention or state oversight of that process. Um, in terms of the separation of church and state, you know, Yugoslavia defines itself going in as a secular democracy, a liberal democracy. It uses this rhetoric of modernity, and you know, part of what I find confusing is sort of how they imagined these lines. Um, we see the fusion of, of religion in, in the public sphere in, in many different ways. We see it with Sharia, the Sharia judiciary. We also see it in the fact that you know, the Yugoslav state made Serbian Orthodox holidays often became national holidays, and they would sort of uh, take on a national character and, and use them for, for that effect. Um, so you know, they are trying to become a secular state, but at the same time, they've created a structural, legal, and political, and cultural structure where secularism is impossible. And I think that's why we see towards the late 1930s these really active debates saying, if we're actually going to be a, demo you know, a liberal democracy, we have to have a secular legal code. And I've, I've written about this elsewhere, but ironically, it's the fascist government of the independent state of Croatia that's the first government to put forth the argument of eliminating all religious law, including that of the Catholic Church. And, and that country is often un identified very heavily with its Catholic, but this question they just decide can't, does not work. And so they are the first ones to take a, sort of an extreme secular stance in wanting to eliminate all religious marriage and, and the rights of the churches to oversee socio-religious law. Yes, sir. So they're not Arabs, uh, they're Slavs, but they are, the majority of Muslims there were Sunni Muslims. Uh, there were small communities of Sufi Muslims as well, but they're, n I've actually read that there was a very tiny Shia population, but I've never actually, other than in the secondary literature, I've never come across any evidence of that in the archives. So I'm not sure if I, I believe it or if it was some sort of yeah, quirk in, in counting people. Uh, but the majority were Sunni Muslims. Um, who kind of followed the Hanafi school of law. 
-hmm. Yeah. Get your head around. Yeah. So there's a local court. Um, most towns had their own local court. There were petitions from some towns that didn't get their own local court, that they wanted a local court, which is why we see actually the expansion of the Sharia courts um, in the 20s. Uh, if you disliked the verdict of the court, you would go to appeals court. If you disliked the verdict of the appeals court, <laughs> you it would take it to the Supreme Sharia court, which was a panel of three. Now, this system operated parallel to a system of muftis, which muftis are considered the highest legal experts in the land. And in that system, you have a judge, sort of the equivalent of the Sharia court judge, which was a qadi. And if one disliked the, or you know, had issue with the qadi, the judge's ruling, you could take it to the mufti who would opine on the subject and then return an opinion, which was not necessarily mandatory. The system of sort of the Islamic religious system and the Yugoslav Sharia system sometimes worked in tandem. So the state would often appoint muftis to be the Supreme Sharia Court justices, because that way, you know, there was a legitimacy within the system, right? So you have people, there's this Qadi mufti relationship. Okay, well, we'll appoint the muftis to the Supreme Sharia Court, and that way people will actually see them as you know, religious experts, because that's what they are within the religion. So they try to operate that and sort of, kind of pair the two together. The real challenge comes in those places where they just kind of ignore, never build any Sharia court system, which continues to then operate on this sort of local system where these muftis have significant power. So I brought this up, actually. This is a map from 1991, but it's the best ethnic religious map I have been able to find. Uh, ultimately, I'll need to create one. Um, it's actually changed quite a bit in that but it remains largely Muslim. Uh, mostly to Turkey at that point. Uh, earlier waves of migration um, were all over. Um, there's a large community of Bosnian Muslims that settled in Harmerville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Uh, but they, they ended up in, in various parts. I mean, a big challenge was that many Muslims in Yugoslavia didn't want to go to Turkey because they felt that, that you know, Kamala's Turkey was a secular state. Uh, there was also discussion in 1938 about forcing Albanian Muslims to go to Albania, which, as I was mentioning before, many Muslims did not want to go there either. So they're sort of stuck in a system of states in which they have no real option. <laughs> yeah, did you? Yeah. Over here. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's actually related to the Interesting. There's a large, I mean, a thriving community. My mother and sister live in St. Louis, and there's like little Bosnia. They just went to a, a little Bosnia festival, and you know, they, I mean, it's, there's, a, there, there's some people make the argument there's more Bosnians in St. Louis, the Bosnian Muslims in St. Louis <laughs> left than in Bosnia. <laughs> Pam. Mm-hmm. 
I found references. I've, I have not been to the League of Nations archive. Um, I have found references to it, uh, but never any responses. <laughs> um, so. Like I'll find, you know, in the minutes of a Vach board, like we need to send this complaint to the League of Nations because, you know, these are our minority rights, but then, you know, no sort of sense of any kind of response. So it, it would be really interesting actually to, to read through some of the petitions and actually see if I could find, you know, in Belgrade any formal formal response because mostly the sense I get are people sort of sending off petitions because they're angry um, but never any kind of meaningful response or intervention on their behalf. I mean the Yugoslav government frequently writes to the League of Nations saying you know don't listen to what they're saying. <laughs> you know we are you know we are doing these are all of the schools we've set up in you know in Albanian language speaking schools and these are all the you know Turkish madrasas that we've formed and um, so they try to kind of actively sort of circumvent any criticism and a lot of those reports are published in French and they you know they write them and they submit them and so they're actively trying to create an image that they are not which I imagine is responding to many of these complaints that they are Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And you don't see them. They never refer themselves as a minority. They don't use that language in 1913, for example, when Serbia, the Kingdom of Serbia takes over territories, right? That's not how they're referring to it then. At that point, even though there are sort of some semi-equivalents of minority protections in earlier treaties, starting in 1878 with the Congress of Berlin, they start to integrate different kinds of, you know, clauses that require states to treat Muslims well or at least acknowledge that they own property <laughs> and um, should be compensated if it's taken. Uh, but you never see them saying, you know, this, this idea of we are a minority. That really only starts to come out after 1919. So they are, they are definitely reading and understanding that there's a new language to be used. And I mean, I think that, that quote is from a town from Doni Vakuf in Herzegovina, you know, treat us like a minority. We are, you know, they're recognizing the subjectivity and trying to kind of create, stake a claim to a minority status um, ahead of time. And part of that is the competition with these other Muslims who are saying, you're not a minority. <laughs> you're, you're, you're South Slavic, you're Yugoslav. Stop fighting for, to be a minority. So. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. This was really terrific. I appreciate your questions and your comments. It's, it's really great. Thank you so much.